Hello and welcome to yet another exciting Shiv Nada Foundation conversation. This is Roshni Nada Malhotra, trustee of the Shiv Nada Foundation, CEO HCL Corporation, vice chairperson HCL Technologies. Through the various institutions of the Shiv Nada Foundation, we strive to create leaders. To our students, faculty, alumni, staff, parents, partners, and the extended foundations and HCL families, a total of at least 100,000 people, if not more, the Shivnada Foundation conversations were created to bring you inspirational stories of leadership. This series has brought to you a Nobel laureate, an award-winning author, iconic business executives, eminent sports, sports personalities, renowned conservationists, and artists. These conversations have been seen over 15 million times. As of today, at 2.37 p.m., I received an email saying, you've got to get glowing. Since we're spending so much time at home and have many me moments, let's give our skin the TLC it deserves. And it's not every day that almost each and every viewer who is tuned in right now, including myself, is a loyal customer. With that, I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Mrs. Palguni Nair, founder, Naika. Palguni, thank you so much for joining us today. No, it's a real pleasure. I'm quite excited to be able to talk to uh, the large community that you talked about. Great. So Palguni, I thought before we begin, I would like to give an introduction to the phenomenal story of not only Palguni, but an equally phenomenal story of Naika. And I hope I'm able to do, do justice. Sure. Palguni, an alumnus, alumnus of IM Ahmedabad, started her three decades illustrious corporate career as a management consultant with AF Ferguson and Company, and then rose to the managing director position at Kotak Mahindra Capital and Kotak Investment Banking. In 2012, she made the transition to entrepreneurship, founding NICA. Nika today commands more than 40% of the online beauty market. It has grown over 100% year on year for the last three years. Today, Nika's portfolio includes over 1,000 brands across makeup, skincare, hair care, fragrances, bath and body, luxury and wellness products for women, men, and 70 stores across 20 states in India. So with that, Again, welcome, Falguni, and it is such a pleasure to have you, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from you today. Sure. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So, Falguni, let me start with our first question, which is um, your journey because of your corporate illustrious career and even your education begins much before Nika. And let's focus on that. How was your childhood and formative years? And I'm sure you watched uh, your father and his business. And did it give you insights into entrepreneurship, especially when you reflect back now? Yes, for sure. So my dad, um, you know, came to India during partition from Karachi with very little. And he started out, he came to Bombay from his village in Gujarat and started out as a Hindi teacher. He, he knew Sanskrit well and Hindi well. And from there, they were all entrepreneurial. So he and his brother started a bearing business, ball bearings, you know, that go into automobile. And they started with trading and they've moved on to manufacturing, albeit small scale. But he built from nothing to a fairly reasonable style, lifestyle and business. And I saw that growing up. But I think more important than that was his belief that boys and girls were equal. And I do have to recognize the contribution of that. So from very early days, he always wanted equal success, education, equal um, opportunity for his daughter, and didn't put her in a bucket that you need to settle for this or that. <clears throat> so with that um, clear, um, that a lot of confidence. I think I never, I never understood constraints in life. And from very early days, I was allowed to dream and travel. I traveled a lot during my very young days. I went on student exchange program to Kashmir and lived with a Muslim family. A lot of things which many young girls in were not allowed to do. I traveled on my own to Europe and US. So there was a lot of uh, formative influences 
through the freedom that both my parents uh, gave to me in early days. And that allowed me to never, um, never uh, take no or I can't do it as a constraint. And I think, obviously, I think education came easy to me. I was a good student. But um, I started dreaming of uh, MBA and business school and everything very early on. And uh, I knew that um, there were no constraints that could stop me from doing what I wanted, which was education first and then uh, work. And the same confidence prevailed later when I wanted to work with young children. And of course, by then, I have to say that my husband, Sanjay, was also very supportive you know, being batchmates, he always uh, always gave me advice to uh, pursue my professional uh, career and choice rather than get bogged down by home responsibilities, so to speak. So that allowed me to never take constraints. I think by the time I was reaching 50, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was like, okay, before I go to retirement age, I need to build a business. So that's how I got started. That's so clearly, that's now that's amazing that you say that because um, uh, uh, the fact that you talked about not even differentiating between you being a young girl versus you know men, and that is so important because then the metrics of measure actually become success and ability to do things and not necessarily gender. And I think that's very important for our listeners and especially our students to realize that um, you know the common metrics is. Uh, success and your ability to execute and do rather than you know whether are you a girl or are you a boy or you know those differentiating factors so i'm really glad that you mentioned that yeah yeah i saw you know a very early stage you know asking for my advice on his business on his diversification on what stocks he wanted to buy in the stock market and you know encouraging me to look at uh, price earning ratios i think I was not even in seventh grade and I used to be looking at, I think those days newspaper used to have a price running earning ratio printed on, on a full sheet of newspaper. So looking at all those things, I think a lot of early encouragement that told me that there were no constraints for me. That's fantastic. And, you know, just as a follow up on that question. So even before Nika, you know, uh, you can share your journey with us and also, you know, the learning that you had in, in, in your uh, uh, corporate career and the different roles that you played and and maybe uh, your most memorable moments and how that got you to the point of entrepreneurship, you know? Yeah, sure. So I think um, from my early uh, days, I joined after business school. I was I, I had uh, got admission at IIM Ahmedabad and it was one of the best institutes and coming out of IIM, I joined consulting because I thought management consulting gives you a lot of learning at early age. But by the time five or seven years in consulting and I felt that I was itching to be a line manager and in consulting, I felt I gave a lot of advice, but I wasn't doing things enough. So I, I, I then made a change to finance and I joined Kotak Mahindra. It was a small bank. I mean, it wasn't even a bank then, but it was a small NBFC. But of course, the right company, right leader. I joined Kotak and I grew with Kotak over 20 years. And at Kotak also, my boss, Uday Kotak, was very supportive because within a year of joining Kotak, I joined Kotak in 1993. By 1994, my husband, Sanjay, used to work for Citibank those days, got transferred to London. And then by 97, we moved to the US. And instead of giving up on me because I think Uday had seen potential, he said, why don't you set up our London office? And I was like, I don't know anything about being a general manager or looking after legal and compliance and everything. And then finally, I said, if he's ready to bet on me, why not? So I took up the opportunity and I set up a London office first, learned everything that I didn't know till then, which was, you know, the whole comprehensive aspect of managing a business. And maybe that gave me confidence that I can do all these things. And then from there, I moved to US, where again, I set up our own office. I mean, first I was at Goldman Sachs, which is our joint venture partner. So, you know, working in different, different environment, being able to deal with that. And then we needed to set up our uh, Kodak Mahindra's own office in US, which I did. So varied experiences in London and US also made me confident. And then I came back to India to head our institutional broking business. I loved broking. I loved stock markets. But um, um, And then soon I started also looking after investment banking. So in my role as investment banker and also early days of stock broking, I took a lot of Indian promoters on roadshow, you know, to sell the equity story to investors. And as I, I took many interesting people, like I took Ajay Bijleaf of uh, PVR, I took uh, Ronnie Skruwala of UTV. Of course, I, we also did IPOs of Mariko and Goodrich. So I 
saw these entrepreneurs uh, over the years because I was associated with them over 20 years. I saw them build their brands. I remember even meeting your dad in our early career, in my early career, and I saw him build his company. A lot of tech companies were built in front of me. I saw so many, and I also saw investors not believing in these um, entrepreneur story. I saw Adani Port, you know, when it was first being conceived. And many of the investors would say like, will Indians ever pay for the, uh, the fee, uh, you know, the, the movie charges for a multiplex that needs to be paid? Or they would say like, I remember Ronnie used to say, I want to build a Disney-like studio in India. And everybody used to laugh at it. So what I got excited about was that these entrepreneurs saw early opportunity. They believed in it before the whole world believed in it. And they went about building their, with their courage of conviction, they went about building their businesses, which after six, seven, eight years was in a strong place. And then everybody started recognizing, oh, this was a great space. This was a great space. So I think that challenge of seeing something early and building it uh, to be a sustainable business is what started exciting me. And then I was itching to do that. So there was at least three to four year period that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I tried to hold myself back saying I have a great job at Kotak. Why would I give it up? And, you know, ESOPs are truly golden handcuffs. They always hold you back. But finally, I said, I need to do this. And uh, I didn't even think about it, uh, about how big the success at Nika will be. I just jumped in. That's amazing. That's amazing. And it's interesting that uh, for a lot of us who are listening, the fact that you mentioned that how regardless of whichever industry, when you're talking about entrepreneurship, at least with entrepreneurs, their ability to spot an opportunity much before anybody else can, and then keep at it for six, seven years before sometimes it actually ends up showing results is really the conviction. And the ability to spot opportunities early is something uh, which is truly unique to entrepreneurs and yourself now. Yes, so that that is my motivation. And I'm so glad I did it. And. And multi-brand retailer for beauty was a similar such opportunity. I mean, everybody told me when I was starting, they said, uh, you know, I started Nika in, uh, two th I mean, I started it in 2012. And in 2013, till 2013, even Flipkart and Snapdeal had not even got funding. So everyone's like, e-commerce was a bad word. I don't think e-commerce was very popular then. And on top of that, people said, if you want to do e-commerce, you have to do electronics or you have to do like fashion. Why are you getting into beauty? Because beauty, even retailing for beauty, even with 100 stores, people did not even touch turnover of 60 to 80 crores. So it was a very tiny business. It was, uh, and But I, I looked at it very scientifically. I felt that beauty has long tail inventory and it's very difficult to sell it effectively during the nascent phase of the business. So if I can sell it online during the nascent phase of the business and then build it up to a size and scale where I can even afford stores, and then I knew that I used to say those days that I know to early investors, I used to say that I know that if I'm dancing, if I'm performing a ballet, I know I'm not in New York, but let, God, let me be at least in Mumbai and not in Tipper. So all I wanted was a little bit of success for beauty. And I was convinced that Indian women, if, um, you know, motivated in the right manner with education and everything will embrace beauty. That's amazing. So. But, you know, uh, the beauty industry, at least in comparison to what you had been doing before and the kind of exposure that you had gotten, how did you come to identify this industry? Or was it something that you were always interested in or watching closely? No. So I evaluated business opportunities from a very uh, investment banker mindset, trying to study the size and the scale and the of the opportunity. Uh, and I, I was uh, good at broking, stock broking. And everybody told me when I was leaving, they said, if you're so convinced about internet, why don't you set up an internet broking firm, you know? And I was like, I don't think India is ready for that. So in 2012, mm -hmm. I feel that India was not ready for internet broking. Today, it may be more. And I felt that uh, India was more ready for a multi-brand beauty retailer, which actually focus on uh, looking at the customer needs rather than push strategy. I also, a lot of, that I observed in terms of a common sense observation. Like I observed that beauty was a ground floor of every big department store, whether in New York, London, Paris, name it, anywhere in the world. And somehow in India, it was not. And I said, this has to be a valuable business. If retailers are giving their ground floor space to beauty, it must be more profitable. So I um, I did have, I'm a very um, you know mathematical and a finance-led person. So I had all these assumptions that I was making about value of the business, the margins, where I can take it, 
So it was very carefully thought through. I knew that retail doesn't have good margins, but I knew that if you're a multi-brand retailer, then you can actually uh, command, you know, multi-brand retailer in an industry where there is a lot of brand proliferation, which there is in beauty. Like in the US, there was so much brand proliferation that no brand had major market share. So I said, if you're a retailer, multi-brand retailer in an industry with a lot of brand proliferation, then you have a lot of power and hence you'll have better margins. So very carefully thought through the whole model. And uh, before I jump in, people thought that, you know, my friends used to tell me, you don't even wear makeup. So like, you know, why are you getting into beauty business? Even today, I yes. I didn't even come to bag with a, one lipstick. So I don't have any lipstick, just one kajal, you know. So I think, yes, I was not into makeup, but I'm into business. So I think that's what I justify saying. Absolutely. No, I think there's another uh, key learning that you just shared with us. And that is about how you went about the mathematical model of uh, uh, creating assumptions, testing with assumptions and evaluating risks. And I think that's something also the best entrepreneurs do it uh, most, you know, methodically. So I think that's something else that is uh, worth noting from what you've just said. Um, you know, so um, of course, Nika's continued growth has been nothing short of remarkable. I think even in my intro, I was, uh, I mentioned to you, you know, Email that I received from Nika today afternoon at 2:37 and I, uh, p.m. and I was quoting from that. And you know, as a customer uh, of Nika and how uh, your uh, your your brand and the company is actually reaching out to um, you know the consumer who's sitting across the computer, and whether it's uh, you know informative in nature, educational in nature, providing different options, and uh, really breaking products down to help uh, you know me as a consumer us as a consumer actually make a decision on what we'd like to buy um, can you briefly describe the nika journey so far and of course it's diversified a little bit uh, i had a chance to look at um, nika fashion and then yeah. you have uh, you know you have your stores and then you also have a strategy around nika trends so i thought we could just describe to us a little bit of your journey so far at at nika and how that's developed since 2012 yeah. So I started with a lot of assumptions, you know, I, I mean, like I was just sitting on my desk and a lot of common sense observations and assumptions coming out of those. So one of the early assumption was that uh, in beauty, which has near, uh, you know, there is an expiry date, typically products expire in three years or so. And I felt that if I was doing beauty business, I should do inventory led business with products coming into my warehouse where I manage the inventory uh, with, uh, you know, um, inventory more efficiently so that uh, I don't get stuck with uh, near expiry stocks. And I felt that this is a way to manage uh, uh, beauty business compared to asking uh, any vendor, any retailer to sell it on a marketplace model. Because if you do it in a marketplace model, a certain retailer who's got stuck with bad inventory, near expiry inventory will try to sell it on your marketplace. So we are not an open marketplace. We are a closed marketplace where uh, and 90% of our beauty business is inventory led. So this assumption we came with um, and we built an inventory led business. And what that meant was we could not take foreign money in our early stage. So we built our business with uh, domestic money, with domestic investors. And so we, we really believed in certain business models and for convenience of chasing high valuation from foreign investors, we did not change our business model. Uh, similarly, another assumption was that authenticity is very important because in, again, in beauty business, there are a lot of fakes, there are a lot of counterfeit products and a lot of brands uh, actually get tempted to try to sell irrespective of the right source of the brand. But we didn't do that. So in our early days, we were selling Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works products on our platform and they wrote to us saying, but <clears throat> we are not presented in India. We don't have registration. So we took it off even though it was a substantial enough business that time, about five, seven percent of our business. So we always uh, respected brands and we only brought brands that were registered into India through a formal process and brought, it, brought through the right distribution channels. So I think many small steps that we took help us win customer trust. And in my early days, I used to say that every business must have customer trust. And the sign of customer trust is usually a banyan tree, you know, which is like very old and ancient. And that's how they get trust. So how does a small company get trust? And we looked at it from the perspective of, um, you know, we, we looked at it from a perspective of how the value system for an individual should be. And we try to bring it to our brand Nika. So what it meant was that 
if I say that up to 30% off, the standard conversation in the company would be, okay, at least 30, 40% of the products need to be 30% off, or otherwise we can't say that. We can't say 50% off and have only five products, 50% off and everything else at 10% off. So all these small, small things we did, authenticity, saying the right things, uh, and, you know, believe, I mean, customers started believing our word. We would never say delivered in 24 hours and take six days to deliver. So we would always err on the side of saying five to seven days and actually deliver in three days, you know. So a lot, so our word meant a lot. And through that, we started gaining customer trust and brand Nika started meaning like by third year, people were writing to me, didn't expect this from Nika. And I was like, okay, this brand means something to people. So I became very proud of that. So I think we built a brand. And then as we built a brand and we had very, we believed in content from day one. And that was a very simple uh, common sense observation. If you go to any beauty store in the US, everywhere, there's a uh, there's a brand person there who advises you on what to buy based on your skin tone, based on what you need, based on your skin concern. So we felt that beauty advice is very important part of selling. So we brought it all through digital. And again, digitally, that's very easy to do uh, because you can have the best advice to thousands of people. Whereas if you go to the store, you know, the advice is very variable depending on the quality of the advisor there. And companies spend a lot of money on training their BA. We also spend a lot of money in training our BA. But I think digitally you can just reach much wider audience. So I think we brought all these, uh, uh, you know, very common sense uh, way of doing our business onto our platform. And we started realizing that customers are very smart and they were observing and recognizing each of these and giving us credit for it. So it, it just became a very interesting uh, way to build a business. A lot of feedback from customers themselves. And then how did the stores come about? So I think we were very, um, uh, we wanted to build an omni-channel business right from the beginning because like I told you, multi-brand retail and some of our inspiration was the US uh, firms which, are, which had large number of multi-brand retail stores. So I think we were very convinced that it needed to be an omni-channel business. For the first two, three years, we were very busy setting up our platform and all the capabilities on the platform. So we started the retail physical store business about four years ago. We had one airport store from the beginning, two airport stores, but we really started in business after that. At that time, you know, the stores could look one of the two. One is a Lux store, which is um, where you have all the Lux brands in one place. And we did have a competitor in Sephora, which already had set up some Lux stores. And we realized that, um, you know, while we try to build a Lux model, uh, we also need to build something unique in India. And I think every customer in India, there are a lot of Lux customers, but there are also customers who want a different offering. So with that, we came up with an offering called Nikon on Trend, which brought some of our best sellers into our store. And today we find that customers love that also. So, you know, we'll have like somehow in both in Calcutta and Indore, we have Lux store and we don't have on trend store. And the customers will be like, but when are you bringing on trend store to us? You know, so they also differentiate between both our stores and uh, they want both of them. So I think customers love both the formats and they love what we have to offer on each format. That's fantastic. So, you know, uh, as you mentioned that uh, a lot of the way you developed your business is on common sense and also getting um, having, I think, a regular communication loop with your customer who's also coming back to you and constantly giving feedback and how you're tweaking as you go over. But if I was to ask you one or two inflection points, either at Nika or um, in the industry, you know, which have uh, allowed you to stay ahead of the curve and in a lot of ways also chart the curve, what would those be? So one was about uh, bringing the Lux brand onto our platform because that, you know, Indian customers wanted it. And somehow the Lux brands all over the world believe that Lux cannot sit next to a Mastige brand. And I work very hard to convince all the Lux brands that in India, today's Dove consumer is tomorrow's luxury consumer. And Indian consumers are very young and their incomes are going to go up through the, you know, through the years. Because a lot of our customers, when they were 18 to 35, they were young. By the time, you know, like uh, their income earning capacity becomes uh, stronger and stronger as they reach age 22, 25 and further, you know, 28 and 30. So we convinced the Lux brands that you need to sit on our platform side by side with Mastige. Otherwise, you know, in the in Europe, the whole tendency was to only have Lux platform and not Mastige and Lux together. So I think that was a very important need of India. And we spent two, three years convincing our important Lux partners to recognize our strategy and come on board. 
And I think that was very unique because what we've done is we've now, we're constantly scaling the consumer up. You know, we also believed in premiumization in India. And we believe that customer is looking for performance-based products. And, you know, some of so much of our emphasis on Mastige was from the past where there were very high duties, countervailing duties, which were very high for, uh, you know, if you had imported product with larger price, then there was a large component of countervailing duty. And, uh, you know, uh, the brands could not give the best quality to the customer, uh, even though the price had gone up. So I think when the GST changed, that also changed it for us. And we always believed in premiumization and performance-based products. So we brought a lot of that. And we put a lot of effort into it. Like we went to Korea, convinced the Korean brands to come to India. So time and again, we, on behalf of our customers, go and convince some of the best. We say that we will give them best of what the world has to offer. And we put in a lot of effort into convincing them. So Korean brand was a very big inflection point. I think additional customers started recognizing Nika when we brought. I remember people will meet me and say, oh, you know, you brought Korean brand that was so good, you know. And we, of course, uh, I think India was lagging behind in skincare. And through that, we covered the gap. Before that, we were only 12% skincare. And post-Korean brands, it became 30% skincare. So many things like that, that we brought into the country. We want to continue to do that. We believe there's a lot we need to do on hair side. So we are doing that. So I think there is a lot going on in, in, in terms of uh, working. And, my, and the and beauty is that our customers have given us, uh, you know, they're so engaged with us. I don't know if you know, but through all our Instagram platforms, we reach so many customers on a regular basis. Like our uh, monthly reach is 300 million through all our social media platform. So we are talking to our customers all the time and they tell us, uh, and they're so engaged. So, you know, when we first, I was in the store, I was like, you know, I'm from Gujarat and I was like, a store in Ahmedabad will not succeed. And, you know, and to my surprise, it was one of our top performing stores. So I think in many ways, you know, uh, as we started announcing our stores, customers were like, you have to come to our city also, our city. So like, it's our customers who told us that you come uh, you know, come where they are. So every time we talk about a store that we announce a store, they'll be like, but why are you not in our city? So we get a lot of feedback from our customers on what they want from us. They even write to us all the time, bring us this product, that product, bring us this brand. Uh, so they ask a lot. That's they're fantastic. Constantly yeah. That's fantastic. So they're also helping drive your strategy and the trends which are prevailing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Falcony, during the past few months, obviously, it's been very challenging time. Uh, but, um, you know, it's the digital dependence of consumers has also uh, gone up significantly, you know, whether it's consumption on online streaming platforms or online retail. And um, Nika has such a strong presence online. And uh, you have a great physical presence as well because of your stores. Uh, but, you know, people have been in lockdown for the last couple of months. So going forward, uh, what do you think will be your spread between a digital and a physical? And, you know, what would be the direction that Nika would be taking? So we have always guided as follows that currently um, our physical retail already accounts for 12% of our turnover. And certain luxury brands, it can be even 50-50. Uh, and that's with 70 stores. So we get a lot of footfalls and we were on a path to about 300 stores. And uh, yes, during uh, the the first phases of the lockdown, we couldn't open all our stores. But by now, most of our stores are open. And we've also started hyper-local delivery because we realized that it's a fulfilling uh, order in Bhubaneswar from Calcutta. It's better we deliver from our store. So we've started doing that for a while. So overall, we do believe that uh, COVID is going to accelerate people's adoption of e-commerce all over the world. That's a trend. And uh, a lot of people had apprehensions about buying online. Even like I had apprehensions about work from home, doing digital videos and calls. Now we are all loving it. So in many ways, I think e-commerce is there to stay. But we believe in omni-channel and we are uh, going to come and we do a lot of hyper-local also now. So I think it will change the model under which you deliver now. And uh, we are working on uh, strengthening that model where I think being closer to the customer from supply chain perspective is important. Also, we started the fashion business, which is now a very significant, uh, it, even there in fashion, we have a big ambition that it will be about 10% of our revenues and over four years, it will be as big as we will. So in fashion also, I recently that a lot of fashion brands are saying that about uh, from, they were only 10% of their turnover was e-commerce, it'll go to 30%. And beauty companies like uh, L'Oreal and Estee Lauder worldwide have said that about 30% of their business will be online. 
So I think online for both these categories is very clearly here to stay. Great, great. Um, you know, now I'm just going to switch gears a little bit. And, uh, you know, you're, you're a symbol and an advocate for strong identity and uh, woman leadership. In fact, I would say all leadership. And heading a brand which promotes the same. And um, any words of encouragement for our students? And and I and um, I did see some of your previous interviews. So it's it's not just for women only because you have a very strong uh, men's line as well. So you know it's breaking all uh, barriers. Yeah. No. So I think uh, my message is on two three fronts mm -hmm. on women. Uh, uh, for women, my message is that uh, you they must dare to, and they must they, they owe it to themselves to allow themselves to dream and then their dreams will be theirs. And I feel that it's not right to um, how constrained uh, on their lives uh, from society or, or anybody. It's you know they, uh, you know we hold up half the sky, so you know it's uh, nobody's telling men to uh, you know to to not dream big enough or to be more measured in their ambition. And I think it's up to each woman. And it's not about working. They should be able to dream and do what they like and pursue what what, what is important to them. And uh, that can be anything. I'm not just an advocate of working in corporate India. That's not what I'm saying. But I think freedom and ability to dream. And in my case, I realized that, that actually by starting my own business, I also said that women should have a right to bet on family wealth you know and i think it's very important because like businesses also go through difficult times and you have to sit through good bad and ugly of the business it doesn't you know so i think um in my opinion i think women should uh, pursue their dream it's very important for them to uh, feel empowered to do that and it's up to them how they balance their lives and maybe they need to balance their lives but it's it's their choice uh, as far as entrepreneurship is concerned, I also have become a big believer in entrepreneurship. I've enjoyed every moment of it. But I do say that entrepreneurship is like a roller coaster ride, and uh, it should be taken on by people who enjoy the roller coaster rides. If you are not into roller coaster ride, you know, don't jump into entrepreneurship. Then maybe you can get equal, um, you know, equal pleasure doing something else rather than being an entrepreneur. And uh, what entrepreneurship means is that you have to like what you do for a long period of time because I think you need to be you need to really give it time to flourish. And secondly, you will go through ups and downs. And during down moments, you can't feel totally dejected. And, you know, you need to have the courage to move forward. And similarly, the up moment should not go to your head because if that happens, then you, again, you'll mess it up. So I think it's a very special type of a ride and people need to embrace themselves for that. But it's it's very interesting entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you. you know, um with the increasing public awareness, uh, you know, there is worldwide for a push for sustainable products, uh, green cosmetics, which have a minimal impact on the environment and health. Um, you know, is this something Nike is thinking about or, you know, product lines uh, and brands which you're uh, going to be bringing in, which would be much more uh, conscious of this? Sure. So a lot of customer millennials. And I think for millennials, uh, you know, environment is very important. And all businesses, even we recently had, uh, you know, some of the senior management uh, gurus uh, address our company. And everybody's saying that environment, uh, you know, um, social inclusion, as well as uh, governance are the three non-negotiable now. And I think Nika is very clear that those are non-negotiable for us. So to the extent possible, we are moving towards being more environmentally friendly. A lot of our products are, you know, um, there's so many terms. So, you know. Uh, no animal testing, paraben free, SLS free, five S's, recyclable plastic, you know, use, less use of plastic. So there's a lot that we're doing. We're trying to embrace everything. Um, and uh, it's not overnight possible to just totally become clean. And also there are implications of what you think is clean also through the supply chain may have not so clean footprint, you know. So I think uh, we are trying to be very environmentally conscious and every decision we take is in an environmentally conscious way. Uh, similarly, also, uh, I think we do believe that businesses have to be there for the community, which includes everybody. Uh, so we always say that we want to give an equal emphasis to all our stakeholders, which is not just the shareholders, but the employees and our customers and also the communities where we operate. And during COVID times, we've truly behaved in that manner. 
So, uh, you know, I think uh, we did a lot uh, for the communities that we are in. Uh, so, uh, so I think in many ways, you know, we have taken all our decisions in COVID times, not governed by profitability, but by a full balance between people and, and business, you know. In fact, more more leaning towards people at this point. But of course, business will move forward and one should have strength to move forward. And the last thing is about governance. And I think from very beginning, having worked in a bank, like I think governance is a non-negotiable for us. So we try to follow all the rules. And I talked about it in the beginning as authenticity and others. So I think we think these are all very important objectives. And uh, towards, um, I think, uh, overall, the beauty industry is moving towards much cleaner you know, product footprint. Great, great. I, you know, now on a personal question, you know, yours is a dynamic family, but Sandhu himself being a strong uh, corporate leader yourself and both your children with, you know, excellent education background, working too now at NICA. How do you leverage all your strength, not only as a family, but also as colleagues, because you work together, at least with your children? Yeah, yeah, I know. So, I think um, I really enjoy working with my kids. I always joke about it that I, as a young mother, I didn't spend enough time with them. So I can now make up for all that lost time. So in many ways, it's very nice. We are always together on a lot of conference calls. And uh, of course, each one of us does uh, different uh, you know, roles. But I think there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, spending time together uh, over business uh, questions like uh, my daughter now is in Delhi and early morning we are doing a conference call about you know her business and there's an hour and a half conference call and like people are thinking why am I talking to her for so long so it's mixed between giving her advice on doing up her home as well as the business so it's a long call so I think it's it's very uh, intertwined and I'm really glad that my children have decided to join the business I think from our perspective we are a family both if you, you know my husband Sanjay a little bit we are a family which really uh, gives uh, importance to five things so I think we are all um, uh, you know, we all are very, I mean, I wouldn't use the word workaholic, but we believe in the Gita philosophy that karma is the way to go. So we all love working and we all love, love working on, on what is the task at hand. And uh, I think that is a bigger motivation to do that well than anything else. So we call ourselves karma yogis and working very, uh, very hard at, at what we are doing. Uh, and that gives us a lot of family joy and enjoyment because we are all like that. And then secondly, I think... Um, the other thing is that uh, uh, we also, I personally feel that I'm a, I'm a very big management uh, student, you know, in the sense that I get a lot of uh, happiness out of learning dis different aspects of management. So having started my career only in finance, as I got to learn technology, I get to learn marketing, I get to learn branding, I get to learn new areas of business, like even operations, you know, I've become much stronger at operations because our business is so operation intensive. So I think learning different parts of management gives us a lot of excitement. So that's the other uh, big motivator for our family. And uh, even for Sanjay as a private equity, they learn different, different businesses. So I think I think coming in and learning different aspects of business is another big uh, excitement that we all have. So I think these are the things that motivate. And then we are all similar in terms of regular exercise and, you know, liking similar things like, you know, outdoor life. So very, very uh, on the same page kind of family. So everybody does the same thing. That's excellent. Excellent. So I just have a few uh, quick response, uh, rapid fire questions, and then uh, I have a few questions on my screen that the uh, viewers have been asking. So we'll jump to that. So first rapid fire question. One entrepreneur from outside India that you look up to? Uh, I have to say it's Bill Gates. I really, uh, uh, I really, um, I've seen some uh, films about him. I also, I love the way he built Microsoft and I also, I uh, love what he's now trying to do to give back to the society, both through Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and also trying to solve really complex problems. And that really motivates me about, you know, who he is. And he's, of course, a brilliant man. So difficult to emulate him. But yeah, he's a, uh, a big inspiration. Absolutely. Who inspires you at a personal level? I think at personal level, uh, inspiration is a very big word, but I've learned a lot from my ex-boss, Uday Kotak, and I learned all the business lessons from him, uh, where, uh, you know, simple things like if it's too good to, uh, to be true, it is probably, so, you know, uh, very, uh, you know, very conservative approach to not uh, breaking any rules from corporate governance perspective to, um, 
to uh, being very honest in your business dealings and not worrying about the, so uh, and you know all that stands you in good stead over a period of time and also like i remember he used to we used to joke about it that uh, you know uh, we don't give high enough uh, savings uh, deposit rate now of course kodak gives very high saving deposit rate and he would be like no we can't afford it so we can't give it but still gather deposits so you know that's how it is you know telling the team that look we need to do this and we have to do it and it's not easy but you know throwing people at the deep end to make it happen so i think a lot to learn from him. um what advice would you give to a 20 something palguni who has just graduated from iim amdabad so i did uh, i did commerce uh, i did bcom and then i did mba and i do definitely feel that i wish i had pursued engineering and i tried to push my daughter uh, also in that direction and she did liberal arts so i am a little bit uh, currently very uh, stuck up about not being an engineer or uh, i also want to start uh, over time you know teach uh, young girls to code because i think it's very important so yeah that's that would be my advice to a young falguni that love to code awesome and um what's your favorite activity when you do take a break sorry can you say again what it is what's your favorite activity when you take a break uh two things i love swimming and i also love watching uh, tv shows these days i'm watching a number of uh, shows like billions and succession many old shows because obviously uh, with all the pressures of work i was running behind so this uh, covid uh, i mean the lockdown is helping me uh, catch up on those great and uh, what would you say is your style mantra uh in terms of the fashion style i have to say that i am a big one for uh, fabrics i love indian fabrics and indian uh, the quality of indian fabrics and, and and sometimes even the workmanship but more fabrics so i'm one of those who is very happy wearing a beautiful fabric that is handmade in india great so palguni we're going to just jump to a few audience questions now if you're okay with that um the first question is from uh, palomi ghosh and she says how do you plan to make business of looking good affordable to the regular indian customer who probably isn't able to buy mac or a victoria secret even though they want to so i want to come in and say that our, our website is very very wide and if you look at it from a skin care perspective you know we sell a lot of uh, um, a large quantity of products like uh even biotech and others which are very affordable brand but excellent quality products that you know customer will benefit using and uh, there are um, so i think uh, and if you look at it from makeup perspective similarly you know we straddle uh, the whole range of brands from l18 and lakme to all the way to mac uh, so i think customer always has choices another very important thing we did is we convince all the luxury brands to come up with the mini versions of their products so i don't know if you've seen on the site but we have mini mac lipstick we have minis of lot of expensive brands so of course uh, they are expensive because packaging is equally expensive but they are definitely at a price point which is about a third sometimes or uh, you know 40% of the original price point so the consumer gets to test the product and if they're convinced and they can buy the bigger sizes thank you the next question is from beda and um she says what kind of struggles does the company go through for launching international brands to nike for example about the recent launch of uh, pixi and can yeah. we expect more international launches uh, in you know during this year of pandemic yes um <clears throat> very interesting question i think customers are really on point so i think we just launched pixi yesterday and uh, Yes I think it takes any between about 2 uh, years or more to convince a brand so the way it works is we identify the brands that we want to bring on our platform we start contacting them we start selling them india story we start talking to them about coming and listing on our platform and then there is a whole process of of course then there is a negotiation of terms and then finally there's a whole process of registration in india and even even after registration is completed you know we have to import products label it here I'm ready to be in our store online and then launch so yeah uh, we uh, are also finding that a lot of international brands are very excited to come into india i think uh, global growth is going to 
especially in more developed markets. And as a result, many of the brands want to bring their products to an Asian market with growth, namely India. So we are we are going to have a very strong, uh, you know, lineup of brands that are going to be launched. Great, I'm sure, and everybody else will be extremely excited to hear that. Um, another question, uh, Palguni, is: uh, Do you think there is enough representation of women in the startup ecosystem, and uh, how do you think we can make it more inclusive? So I personally feel that uh, uh, women um, have a lot of great ideas. Very often they come from a design perspective or they come from uh, coming up with certain ideas um, on a business perspective. But I think very often they don't embrace all the hard parts of the business, which includes negotiations, fundraising. Also, um, uh, you know, I mean, just uh, just a whole bunch of uh, activity that uh, you know needs to be done successfully to see come to fruition and as a result you know they uh, they are not able to sustain their business and grow them to a scalable levels so i think if there are more opportunities to um, uh, to give mentorship you know and learn uh, through others is very important i uh, definitely felt uh, i think early days uh, people used to ask me to talk about uh, you know, uh, uh, work-life balance and how did I cope? And I used to not find it very exciting to talk about, but I always realized that when I talk about it, uh, there are always people who take inspiration because they are going through difficult times with a young baby, they're leaving their baby at home and feeling guilty about it. So when they heard me say that I used to feel guilty and now I don't, you know, it gave them courage. So I think talking more, uh, many of the entrepreneurs should talk about their journey. They'll give a lot of... Uh, lot of courage to others who are going through similar you know difficulties in the early stage of their business uh namit asks uh, ma'am who is your one competitor uh, whose work you like a lot uh i definitely um there are two i is uh, i like so one is amazon i feel amazon is very good at uh, uh, you know, customer service aspect and the uh, the from customer delivery to giving information to the customer about uh, uh, what's going on on their order. And we have uh, learned a lot from them. I have read Jeff Bezos's book, which where he said that every customer complaint told him about some errors in his processes and he fixed them. And that's what I do. I look at every customer complaint with a view to not not say, oh, this is not important enough. It's one in 1,000 or one in 10,000 order that sees that. But I see it as an error in our process that needs to be fixed. So I think I've really inspired that from Amazon. And uh, another uh, another competitor is Sephora. I've always admired Sephora from perspective of giving um, at least what looked to the customer as a customer-centric advice on what products should be used. And uh, that really... Uh, uh, help them uh, uh, get loyal customers who uh, were earlier feeling very pushed by the brands, that brands were always pushing their own agenda. And with Sephora, customers started feeling that customer was at the center and Sephora was giving advice based on what customer need was, at least I felt when I was a Sephora customer. So these are my two competitors that I admire. Great. Um, Soumya asks, how did you build your initial team once you had the idea of starting Nike, finding the first people? join you in your journey yeah so i left uh, kotak on uh, march 31st and on april 1 i was the lone employee working for one month i i set up the company and all that and then by me for had four people who joined me so one of them was for head of content i just happened to meet the right person for content i believed in content for nika so even though it was not an important recruitment right at the beginning i did uh, uh, take that recruitment forward. But the two other important people was one was head of uh, technology. So he was from IIT Bombay and then I am Ahmedabad. So to me, he was like blue chip education. So I think I did lean a lot on uh, on the quality of their uh, education. Uh, but uh, what was different was that at Nika, because I didn't know beauty, I didn't know technology, and I gave myself a chance. So that culture has stayed. So we constantly take people who are conviction and passion about Nika and working at Nika and they're smart people and we think they learn anything we don't try to assess whether they know the job for which they're coming in 
So as a result, we really give a lot of breaks to people. So all across the firm, you'll find people have never done digital marketing. They're getting a chance to do digital marketing. Someone who's never done uh, even online, you know, they come from Vogue and they start working in our fashion business. So we are always giving break to people who don't have the relevant experience. All right, that's great. Um, Gaurav Podar asks, what is the expected impact of the current cycle of the online cosmetics and the beauty products industry. Are the volumes um, at lower level or do you uh, expect to regain the same volumes or more? He's talking about the lockdown related uh, adversities. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we started, I think even today I was, uh, look, I was looking at another uh, uh, you know, presentation from uh, CLSA and, you know, somehow inherently we started feeling that once uh, the lockdown began, we started comparing vis-a-vis -vis, um, vis -vis February uh, run rate rather than our projected and budget numbers because projected and budget numbers had growth in it. So we said, let us first at least compare with February, which was a non-COVID month, and then try to compare where we were uh, in April. So in April, because of uh, focus on essentials, we came out at about 20% of our February business. And in May, we have come out at about 75% of our February business. I never imagined, uh, we were very conscious about not uh, having too many losses. So in the past, we built our business with very, uh, a lot of prudence with hardly um, only 20 to loss in a month. And we saw that in the month of April, if we had zero turnover, we would have had that kind of loss in just one month itself. So these lockdown times have been very difficult from profitability perspective. And the three months of uh, April, May, June, will see the level of losses over those three months that we had not seen over full two years. So I think there is adversity, but we are crawling back to normal volumes. I think June, our plan is to be at 90% of our Feb volumes. And then starting with July, we want to regain growth. And during the year, we want to take initiative of lesser digital marketing and wherever we can control our expenses. So that at the end of the year, by the end of the year, we would have lost some turnover due to lockdown and we would be uh, less profitable than without the lockdown. But still, we manage it at a reasonable level and don't, uh, you know, try to crawl back on some of the losses of the first quarter. Um, Isha Tiwari is a regular user of uh, your own Nike product. And she says that, you know, what inspired you to start Nike's own range of beauty and personal care products? So it's quite customary for retailers to have their own brand, but as a consumer who, and I said I was not an avid uh, makeup consumer, but I think as a consumer in India, I used to find that uh, even like I go to a parlor at Oberoi, and even at a top parlor at the Oberoi, there were no nail colors. You know, OPI nail colors were difficult to import and there were no good quality nail colors. There was a whole bunch of some suboptimal nail colors here and there. And I said, if this is the condition even at a you know at a big parlor at in bombay then what will be the situation elsewhere so i saw a lot of market gaps and we started our brand with a view to fill those gaps so there was no indian brand with very good offering on nail color so we started with that then we also realized that there's no indian brand offering a good bath and body range so we came up with a whole range of bath and body products called wanderlust we wanted to bring the smells and you know smells from all over the world like lavender from France and, you know, rose from England and, you know, country rose from England. We wanted to bring those smells to the Indian consumer. So, uh, you know, we also launched Japanese cherry blossoms. So that range we introduced. And then slowly we decided to offer the full range of um, cosmetics. And now we also have a brand along with our partner, Katrina, which is called K-Beauty. So now, of course, we are on a journey to build a number of brands. Uh, in Nike Naturals category also, we have a number of skincare products. And now we are also offering uh, what we call as COVID essentials. So we're going to have travel sanitizers. We already have sanitizer. We have travel sprays and many other hygiene-related products. Great. I think um, this is going to be my last question. I also find the last question. You know, Falcony, uh, Products have often been associated with a certain age group and a certain profile of individual. And as you uh, foray into entrepreneurship, you know, at the age of 50, and that too as a woman, um, you know, uh, do you think uh, your journey was easier? I think I think it's a question about uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship, does experience come talent or vice versa? 
Oh uh, yeah, so I think uh, someone very well put it that you know, I I was not a tech, I was not a techie, I was not young, I was not a man, I was a woman, and uh, I mean there were many things that didn't make sense, like you know, for a successful entrepreneur. But I also feel that long years in banking, and uh, you know, with what my experience that I had, which was very well rounded from management perspective, from negotiation perspective, from uh, finance perspective as well as from legal perspective i think that has helped me build a very solid business uh, which uh, you know which is very unique and sometimes you know a lot of um, startups uh, achieve the initial success and then they flounder because they've not been built on very solid fundamentals uh, because very often uh, there are startups that just chase revenues and don't look at a balanced business model so i think some of the drawbacks that seem on paper seem to have helped me build a more solid and sustainable business excellent and uh, with that um, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing so much with us of your journey before entrepreneurship now in entrepreneurship and i think your uh, last statement summed it up well that you've uh, carried the best of your experience from before entrepreneurship to put it into your entrepreneurship to truly build um, really an iconic uh, company for india and definitely uh, so important to everybody who's there you know we appreciate it i think if people weren't on nika before lockdown they were certainly on nika when the lockdown happened so uh, you know thank you so much for everything and uh, mm -hmm. and i'd like to just thank shubhnada foundation uh, families and everybody who's logged in this conversation will still be uh, on our portal for you to see later and um Albany, congratulations truly it was a no no thank you very much roshni it's been an amazing hour spent uh, talking here so i've really enjoyed it thank you very much for giving me the opportunity thank you thank you